Hi there, I'm Ken, the founder of Minotank. What is Minotank? Minotank is a platform to connect early stage tech startups and investors through an online pitch. Want to pitch your early stage tech startup to hundreds of investors absolutely free? Interested in investing in early stage tech startups yourself? Head over to minotank.com to join our email list to learn how. All right, everybody, enjoy the pitch. Hey there, guys. This is Ken with Minotank, and I have Charles Herring, the co-founder of Witfu, and we are so excited to announce their successful capital raise after appearing on Minotank. So we're going to take a deep dive into this conversation, how Witfu successfully raised more than $1.3 million in capital, and what their process was. We all know this is kind of the tip of the iceberg. You see the very end. You don't understand the mass below it. So, Charles, thank you for joining me, and I'm so grateful that you pitched on Minotank. Well, thanks for having me, Ken. You've been a, uh, it's been great to be a part of uh, the Minnow Tank story and for Minnow Tank to be a part of the Whitfu story. Wonderful. And I couldn't be more grateful. You know, that's the whole purpose of what we want to accomplish is try to help early stage tech startups get more publicity, more exposure out there and eventually raise capital. So referencing what you just said, why don't we talk a little bit, Charles, about the Whitfu story. Talk to me about the inception, where you guys came from. I know you guys have an, an interesting history with you and your co-founder. So the Whitfu story is very personal for me, Ken. In, in 2001, I was uh, had been on active duty in the U.S. Navy for about six years. And much of that time, I was forward deployed with an aircraft squadron doing um, uh, patrols in the South China Sea and in the Persian Gulf. And when uh, the attacks on September 11th happened, I fully expected I'd be joining my shipmates on another tour uh, in the Persian Gulf. But it turned out my contributions to the war on terror were going to be quite different. Um, the Department of Defense had become concerned about cyber warfare and as a result wanted to bolster uh, cybersecurity. And so a few months later in 2002, I was detailed to the Naval Postgraduate School where we chartered the Network Security Group. A couple of very big problems that you generally don't see in uh, military organizations. The first was we could not gain situational awareness. And I mean, it was mm. extremely bad. We didn't even know if we were being attacked. So you can imagine in a military unit, you generally, the first thing you want to know is, is someone shooting at me. But in cyber warfare, we could not distill uh, what was going on. And it wasn't because we didn't have information. We had billions of records coming in every day, millions of alerts, but we had seven sailors trying to make sense of all of that. And it was just data overload. Sure. And it led to a couple of cascading problems. The first was, since we couldn't figure out if we we're being attacked, uh, that was really the unit of work. And if we don't have a unit of work, I can't manage the guys that are responding to that unit of work. So I didn't know if they're doing the work correctly, how much, what they needed in professional development and so forth. And secondly, we couldn't roll a report up to the Admiral and to the Captain on uh, what our situational state was because I couldn't calculate it. <laughs> and it put us in a desperate situation. You know, how do you, how do you deal with that? So we started doing everything that we could think of uh, reached out to the research departments at the Naval Postgraduate School, to the University of Hawaii, reached out to the folks at Georgia Tech, where I met the folks from Landcoke, which I, I later went to work for, uh, reached out to InfoWorld Magazine, and I started doing product reviews on everything that was being developed, trying to see what was working. We even uh, went to every conference, we competed in hacking competitions, we did everything that we could think of to, to solve the situational awareness problem. And uh, that led to us understanding the second major problem, which was the expertise that you needed to have to win in cybersecurity is, is broad. You have to learn malware analysis, network analysis, memory forensics. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And each one of those things is extremely complex. Um, you have, it takes a long time to learn those things. So on top of being broad, it's also very deep. So the expertise is very complicated. So as I left, uh, uh, the Navy and went into um, the private sector. I was still working with public sector uh, and then later with the Fortune 500 and Global 2000, that's where I met uh, Tim Bradford as we were touring the country working, trying to solve those same problems that I had uh, at the Network Security Group for, um, uh, for global companies. And every meeting we went into, it was like looking in a mirror when I saw these investigators, these executives, these managers, it was like seeing myself in 2002 when I saw the exhaustion and the exasperation that they, they couldn't gain that same situational awareness. And so um, by 2016, you know, fast forward a good, uh, 
you know, almost 15 years later, you know, uh, Tim and I, and along with some other folks who met along the way from law enforcement uh, that was concerned about this, as well as a couple of the original members from the network security group, we formed WITFU. And we started doing research on how do we solve the situational awareness problem. And so we knew it was about the expertise. There's just not enough of these experts and you can't have them all. And so in the early days, uh, we would just go out and interview people. We would watch how they did their work. You know, how does a, a, malware, uh, a malware analysis guy do his work? And we'd put a stopwatch to him, we'd watch all of that. But uh, that's really what the wit of WITFU is, Ken. It's going out and reaching out to the community and uh, gathering the expertise of the global security community and bringing it back. And today we do a lot of that through crowdsourced machine learning. So okay. as investigators are doing their work, we watch how they do it through our program. And if they do something that's new and innovative or different, uh, that comes to our attention and we, we dig deeper into it. And if it has merit, we, um, we then push it out to our community, which is the foo. So if the wit is bringing in the information, foo is putting it to work. So as all of our customers are learning and innovating, uh, that benefits our entire community. And so as a result, uh, the product we've built with Foo Precinct is the first comprehensive security operations platform that's ever come into the market and it's powered by the expertise of our cybersecurity heroes. So that's uh, 17 years in a nutshell. That's super interesting. So what you're saying is very much the network effects style. So what that means is <clears throat> uh, you are, every single time someone is utilizing the precinct or your platform, mm -hmm. it's adding to the future of WITFU. So every new client you take on, I understand a little bit more about your business. We can get into that in a minute. But, you know, as we're adding new people to do more cybersecurity work, you're leveraging their work and their knowledge to benefit the entire platform. So every new customer, every new user, is adding to the overall mission. That's right, and that was one of the fundamental challenges in cybersecurity is the uh, the attackers, the hackers, if you will, have been able to innovate and change faster than uh, we can inside of big organizations. And part of that is just their ability to share information and tools, to share expertise. Sure. And so it really is silly that a, a multi-billion dollar organization can be attacked by a, a punk kid with a laptop. Right, the, 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 that shouldn't work. But the reason it does work is because of this sharing of expertise. And really the result that we have by bringing in that expertise is that every member of an organization from the junior IT administrator all the way to the board of directors can have the situational awareness because we're evolving uh, the data. We don't just study the investigators, we study the, uh, the managers, we study the executives, and we learn, we study the auditors. What things uh, do you need to know and how do you resolve those things? So it's, it's really empowering. I, I love this job at this point to, to see those faces, that anxiety, that exhaustion, that exasperation melt away, and to be a part of that. I mean, that's priceless. That's worth uh, waking up every day. Yeah, but, you know, for an investor's point of view, and the reason why, obviously, you've successfully raised so much venture capital is the fact is cybersecurity is never going away. Uh, if we're building every single thing in this world now based on a software platform, I would, I would challenge you to reference a single thing that goes on in your life that does not touch several points of data and that you don't interface with a multitude of probably 15 to 20 programs, whether it's your public transit, your vehicle, your cell phone, there's, it's not possible. Right. Uh, yeah. Therefore, security, I mean, as you see with everybody, Facebook, everything else is, is paramount. It, it's it's an every day turn on the mainstream news has become a, a systemic problem and that's why we want to fix that and it's not because people aren't trying but can you imagine having to process a million of anything in a day no and so, you know, <laughs> and so having a team of guys that go in and they work as hard as they can they work overtime and they still can only do one or two percent of their workload every day that's devastating i mean and then for the consequences to be uh, you know getting fired or being uh shamed on uh, national TV, that's a tough racket. It's hard to sign up for that kind of deal. True, true. All right, so let's dig further into your fundraising efforts. So talk to me, you know, you guys are US veterans. Um, you work extremely hard, you have a lot of experience. It should have been, you know, a piece of cake raising capital, right, Charles? You didn't, you didn't even try. You said, uh, we sent out a few emails and, and boom, your account was so full. You said, oh God, this is a... <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what, we, actually, frankly, we thought it was going to be that easy, Ken. Uh, it turned out it was not that easy. Uh, and, you know, cybersecurity, you know, as we mentioned, is in the mainstream news. Uh, last year, uh, in 2017, there was more than $140 billion, with a B, dollars spent on products like with, like with Food Precinct. Uh, 
Yep. And uh, because of that, there are dedicated investment firms and venture capitalists that only invest in security because it's such a lucrative market because so much money is being spent and that uh, and uh, so we thought it'd be easy. We have the first platform that uh, that uh, does exactly what the market wants. It's innovative. We've got a great team. But the, the first problem we ran into was uh, what I call the component problem, component versus uh, solution problem. A good friend of mine once remarked that going to a cybersecurity conference is like going to uh, a transportation conference where all of the attendees want to buy cars and all the vendors are selling car parts. And we still live in that world in cybersecurity where everyone are, everyone is building components and it might take six or 18 months to procure it because procurement is difficult and then take one to five years even to get it uh, rolled out, connected into your existing cybersecurity uh, architecture, get people trained and build process around it. So it's exhausting for customers uh, to go through that process. And you compare that to Whitfoot Precinct, you can go to our website right now download uh, our package, deploy it, uh, turn the license key on, and even a Fortune 500 uh, global company can be uh, can monitor the entire globe in less than an hour and gain situational awareness. So you look at the differences, uh, it's huge. And so the market is certainly ready for it, but the component problem was a huge problem for us in the investment community because all of these investors had invested in all these different components and you know playing on the car analogy we would roll in in a car and say isn't this great don't you want to invest in a car and like well your car has a tire on it and we've already invested in a car i mean in a tire manufacturer yep. and so virtually every um, uh, firm we approached had one to three conflicts in their portfolio or perceived conflicts and they couldn't take us on and then you know we also had a handful that uh, just thought it was impossible to do what we said we're doing or what we've done now. Sure. And so uh, you ran it. So we realized that big pot of money, that easy approach that everyone <laughs> was pulling from, wasn't available to us. And that was um, that was uh, a wake up call. And so we had to, as a good lean startup does, when the strategy doesn't work, you pivot. <laughs> to sure. find a new strategy. And so we knew we had to go somewhere else. So the first place we decided to go was just to traditional uh, investors, folks that invest in everything, you know, just uh, non-security, non-tech even. Sure. And uh, pitch to them. And we ran into uh, a few problems. First, uh, security is extremely complicated. The technology is complicated. Understanding what a WITFU is takes a good amount of effort. Uh, what does Precinct do? And then beyond that, the, the way that valuations are being done inside of cybersecurity right now, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the goals for businesses are much different than they are in uh, traditional startups, traditional businesses. Uh, we regularly see scenarios like uh, a, a security startup raising 30 or $50 million in uh, early stage funding so that they can close five to $10 million in revenue. Uh, so spending four to you know four to one <laughs> on a uh, raise on uh, spending four dollars to raise one dollar or close one dollar, and then they'll exit with a valuation of three or four hundred million dollars in a couple of years. Sure. So trying to explain how any of that's supposed to work uh, to uh, someone that understands business, <laughs> looking at a gap accounting uh, perspective, wasn't happening. Yep. So, <laughs> So uh, we had two choices. We either had to spend a whole lot of time educating these investors on why, um, why we're different, why we're innovative, why these valuations are right, or we had to change our business. And so in the end, we ended up doing both. <laughs> we ended up uh, making some radical shifts to make our business more attractive to a traditional investor. And we also had to get much better at, uh, at marketing. Wonderful. And I know that you, now one of the other things that I want to address is the process in which you raised capital. So you entered traditional investors, you went to all the cybersecurity folks, they were all busy building components. By the way, I love that metaphor. I think it's so great because cybersecurity, you know, one of the, one of the most simplistic reasons, Charles, what did I say to you when I first met you? I met you at a conference and what did I say to you? Do you remember? I have no idea, Ken. I, I said like, to you, I don't like cybersecurity because it's yeah. too amorphous. That's true. You're it's right. It's so easy. It's the same thing as when someone defines AI to you. Uh, we're yeah. an AI company. And the problem is, it's the same thing as we're a cryptocurrency company. They're, these buzzwords become very dangerous because you say, oh, you hear a few valuable investments, $30 million, $50 million goes here. And then you get it gets a little polluted. 
the market gets saturated very quickly. So that's, yeah, that's true. This is magic, right? And, and so right. We, it we, is magic. We, we use buzzwords <laughs> to escape having to have concrete business conversations. Right. Right. And so. Let's talk about, and I want to dig further into how you raise capital, because I know you use multiple vehicles. You did not just use, you know, the traditional, you go to angel investors. You had to diversify and you had to pivot and you had to figure it out. So talk to me about a little bit more about the different processes and how you address those challenges of raising capital. So, you know, when we started uh, trying to raise capital, we, we started at we started working from the beginning. We, we would do the marketing and then we sort of iteratively got further down, you know, in the, the end result, which you hope for is a term sheet, then it closes, right? You sort of start at the, at the pitch and you work your way back, uh, work your way to the end. Well, we realized in doing these exhausting multi, multi-hour, we were spending 12 to 20 man hours per pitch between yep. trying to tweak and everything, and it was exhausting. And so we decided we were going to reverse engineer the process. So what we did is we went back and we said, how can we change the business to be more palatable? So we did things like, uh, you know, move away from the security startup model to a standard, like we're running a hardware store, right? Let's just go back to the most basic type of accounting uh, that we can. And so we did, we, you know, reduced OPEX by more than 90%. We did some very painful layoffs to reduce, um, uh, to uh, to reduce our operating, um, expenses we took we had uh, several thousand dollars of cost of goods sold in our product we ripped all of that out and we uh, we built that, those things from scratch and made an extremely uh, sustainable uh, and easy to understand business model so that was sort of step one then so we have okay we have an easy to understand business and then we also came up with a very simple valuation uh, it's it, it's here's our run rate our valuation is 10x that run rate uh, the very arithmetic now. We don't have to do calculus to come up with a value. Sure. And then then we said, okay, what's next? The term sheet. So we came up with our own term sheets. We just we wrote them. This is a this is a great valuation. DIY, it's, everything. Yeah, DIY. That, that's right. This, <coughs> we're, we're gonna do it. And so we wrote the term sheet and then we said, okay, next thing is uh, we have our term sheets. How what kind of vehicles will we take the terms on? So we uh, we did uh, set up a uh, vehicle for convertible notes. We took that to um, our stakeholders and the board and said, okay, we want to have convertible notes in the following terms. Um, we also want to have just direct, you know, SEC Reg D type of investment opportunities for investors. And then we also said, let's uh, go ahead and open it up t- uh, uh, to crowdfunding. And so really those three different avenues became the way that we were going to collect uh, capital. And so that we said, that's these are the ways that are available to you investors because there's a lot of time spent just invest. Uh, having conversations about the vehicles and the term sheets. So like, here's the, the horrible conversation. Let's have it first. And if, yep. it's, if it doesn't make sense to you, don't waste our time and we won't waste yours. Sure. And then once we had that done, we said, okay, now we need to explain all of this to people. And so that really took us into, um, be, because of those vehicles, we decided to use start engine as, uh, as our marketing, uh, platform and the and nice engine is a crowdfunding resource correct just that's to right. clarify for the audience that's Got right it. so it's, it's a website uh, where you can go as a as a simple uh, non-accredited investor even and, and invest into the companies that have published on uh, start engine very much like a kickstarter but for equity equity got it and um so the nice thing about the Start Engine uh, campaign was, you know, we did the SEC filings through Start Engine, and those were published there. Our financial disclosures were published. That's another hiccup when people want to see those and they don't like them. Well, they're already on they're on the website, so you can go download them. So now it's easy for everyone to see your information. So let's say you go to a conference and you know you're exhausted. There's only two of you. You you, yeah. you speak for six or eight hours. You're always on your feet, and they say, "Well, I want to look at your information." Go to this website. Yeah, go to Fantastic. This website. That's right, and we have all of our marketing materials. So, it goes, so it basically goes all the way back to the marketing. It has videos of Tim and I explaining the business and the history, uh, the product, some testimonials from uh, from partners, the timeline, everything you would want to know. It's basically the, the pitch is everything from the pitch deck to the term sheet. Got it. Um, and so that really helped us reduce the educational uh, part of the conversation with the traditional investors. Um, but it did open up. Uh, some additional challenges, right? But before I actually, before I get there, let me say this. So once we have that up, right, we have the start engine thing there, that's not gonna do it, right? You just can't put up a website, it's not filled to dreams. Uh, it's, it's, you just can't build it and they're gonna come. So you have to do the same things that you would do if you're going door to door. So we went to fun conference and other uh, other conferences where we met you, Ken, 
and we would stand at the booth and as you said we would say here's what we do if you don't understand it here's a website where you can get all of the details and you know through that process we were getting uh, contacted by uh, prospective investors and you know the conversations were easier they weren't taking 12 or 20 hours they were taking one or two hours fantastic it's good so great reduction uh, and that cost to us. And then we also started marketing uh, through uh, vehicles like Minnow Tank, which has been very helpful, just getting the word out. And, you know, frankly, going through that backwards process of examining the business and the term sheet and going, uh, going through all of that, it allowed us to understand our business better. It made us better at articulating it and uh, explaining it to investors. I remember when you came to our booth at Fund and, and asked, "What's your one sentence? Uh, what's a, you know, what's your one sentence pitch?" I'm yep. like, I'm like, get out of here. I don't know. I'm not going to do it. Everyone, everyone is bothered by that. So I'm, yeah. I'll make the audience laugh. So every time I speak to any startup founder, the you know, I, I call it like a throw up situation. They're so excited. You can see their eyes bulge and they're like, <gasps> <Bleh. Yeah. laughs> they give you so much information. And so what I say is I want two sentences. Yeah. That's it. Because if you can't communicate, I mean, every, every single entrepreneur will tell you, if you cannot communicate your business in two sentences, you have not sharpened your craft hard enough. And it's a super challenge. It's not easy to be succinct. Well, and it's, it's also, it's also, I think an existential uh, process to, to learn to know yourself and your business well right. enough that you can explain it. It's very uh, nebulous in your mind. You know what it is. You know you can see it, but being able to explain it's a whole different thing. So the process of going through uh, iterating through that uh, to be able to you know go through you know Whitfu Whitfu Precinct is a cybersecurity uh, platform that uh, crowdsources the expertise to give situational awareness to everyone from the junior administrator to the board of directors. Uh, that takes work. You know, sure. to get there, to understand what is it that we're doing and really to get out of our own perspective and understand the perspective of the investor. And it's a different pitch for us when we're pitching to a customer, a prospective customer uh, or to a reselling partner um, or to an investor. It's just you have to know the audience, understand uh, where they're coming from. But yeah, it certainly was, uh, you know, the challenge, but about setting up the whole architecture, really starting at the very end, uh, create the vehicles, create the uh, term sheet, do the filings. And then at that point, it was it really was about just reducing our cost in this process, because you know one of the things you, you just we did not know is how m much of our manpower had to go towards fundraising. And when the sure. fund, when, you're, when you're spending it on fundraising, you're not spending it on your customers. You're yep. not developing your tech, and that's devastating, um, you know, for us. So you have to find a way to reduce those costs. You know, as we fine tuned our business by reducing how much it costs us to sell something, how much it costs us to support it. Um, we also had to find a way to reduce the cost of uh, pitching. And so that whole backwards process, here's the vehicles available, here's the term sheets, here's the marketing, here's how we're gonna tell you about it. And uh, it just made it very, uh, very streamlined and uh, the whole process became ultimately succinct and uh, sustainable for us. And it's awesome. So, you know, even though it was difficult, taxing and exhausting, you did learn a lot more about your own business. Mm -hmm. You did expand your mind into how to properly, succinctly explain it. And you found the ways to make your business more efficient, which is truly what capitalism is, right? You are hit with a wall. Things are not easy. Therefore, you must change and adjust and do better. That's so right. although, you know, it's, it's like uh, when you go through a hardship, like it's a hardship, but the fact is you're better off for it afterwards. Yeah, and, so, yeah, and I, you know, I was gonna say, the, there's, uh, there are rich lessons in failure, right? There's almost nothing to learn in success. If everything worked like you thought it was gonna work, then you really didn't have an opportunity to learn something. But, um, you know, we never would have thought that we would be in trouble because we were doing too much. Leapfrogging the current industry, you know, where the industry currently is, did not seem like that was gonna be a barrier to entry. <laughs> but it, it was, you know, there was no way for us to see it until you're confronted with it. And then you pivot, you know, that's what lean companies do. You, 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 you build, you measure, you test, you accept the results, and then you, you build something different until sure. it works. Right, right. So, um, so I just want to get to the end of this conversation because, you know, we, we've already spoken for quite a long time. You've raised successfully $1.3 million. I know you have some more possible checks coming in, but we know the 1.3 is in the bank. It's mm -hmm. succinct and done. And I know you're also coming very close to profitability as what you mentioned before the call. Yeah. So why don't you tell us a little bit about where's Whitfu going in the next three years? You know, what can we expect to see out of this company? Right. So for uh, for 2017, we have a handful of goals that we've messaged to our uh, to our shareholders. Uh, first is profitability. We're going to finish this year uh, profitable. We are you know inches away from uh, from that right now, 
And uh, that's number one. Uh, number two is uh, uh, getting to a $2.5 million run rate at least, where we were at a you know half a million dollar run rate last year. So that's a, a 5X improvement, uh, which, should, uh, which on our same valuation will be an improvement from a $5 million valuation to a $25 million valuation by the end of the year. And so from a business perspective, that's really what we're focusing on. Uh, we do, the way our uh, uh, product is priced is on a recurring uh, subscription. And so we also have built the business so that our expenses stay underneath our recurring revenue. So that way uh, we, we know uh, we know how to scale the business out. Hold course, on, you're telling me you run a profitable business? <laughs> well, that's the hope. That is the dream, <laughs> right? To, to make more money than we spend. That's uh, it's a very basic. Crazy. Uh, are you even a tech company? Are you sure? Well, we're trying. We're trying <laughs> something nutty, uh, some old fashioned running. It's, it's what happens when you have old guys trying to run a startup. Um, Obviously but, successful. It's it's, not, well, age has nothing to do with it. Yeah, it works. But mostly what we want to do, Ken, is continue to focus on uh, our our customers, right? We want to fix this problem of cybersecurity. It, what, what we like to say internally is we're like the NASA uh, to um, uh, to these cybersecurity heroes. If Buzz and Neil need to drink orange juice in space, we'll make Tang. You know, whatever it is that we find, whatever gap is not covered, we're going to find a way to help them cover it. And so it's really just about being in the field, studying our customers, uh, looking at the data, and uh, making the world safer as we equip them. Uh, so it's really not, so we're not doing the real work. The guys in the front lines are doing the real work. We're just equipping them with better gear so that they can go from systemic failure to uh, regular success to where, you know, we don't turn on the TV every morning and see some breach. That's going to be a rare thing um, once we get to the end of it. So mostly we're heads down, keep the business growing, uh, profitable. And as we uh, as we uh, trek forward, we're going to we're going to take care of the cybersecurity problem that we have in this current state of uh, human history. I love it, Charles. So that's Charles Herring from Whitfu. The fact is, at at least a minimum $130 billion TAM, uh, it's only going to be growing. I can't even imagine what it's growing by 10, 15% per year. Must yeah. be one of the largest industries in the world. It is. We're supposed to hit 200 billion this year. So wow. and amazing. Why? Yeah, so it is crazy. And, you know, Ken, before we sign off, I just want to thank you again for, you know, letting us be a part of the Minnow Tank adventure as you've been a part of the Whitfu adventure. Um, you know, as we've gone through the little bit of the history at Whitfu, um, the way that we solve our problems is by seeking out diverse thought, right? It's getting out of, um, getting out of the group think of the way we've always thought and the way we've always done things. And really, Minnow Tank's doing a very similar thing by looking to inspire and equip uh, diverse uh, diversity in the startup community, we get to see the, the way that startups are run, uh, that they can change. And so I'm encouraged to be a small part of that. And uh, you know, as we can help each other, I'd love to uh, keep the, keep the um, ball rolling. Well, your success story number two. So after this, Middle Tank is coming close to have helped raise more than $2 million. So we're thrilled to have you, Charles. Um, I remember when we first talked, you said, uh, I don't know, we're two old guys. Are you sure you want old guys? <laughs> and I said, absolutely. That makes you diverse. Isn't that interesting? It um, helps. So Charles, thank you very much. A successful $1.3 million plus dollar raise for Whitfu. Thank you very much, Charles, for participating. Thanks, Ken. Thanks for having me.